Okay, hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Neha Narula, and I'm a PhD student at MIT. Uh, and I'm here to talk about consensus and consistency. Uh, so first, a little bit about me. Uh, in a former life, I was a software engineer at Google, and I worked on a bunch of different products there, including a shopping website, which we launched in Germany. That was fun, Frugal. Um, and a storage system for large binary objects. And then for the past six years, I've been a PhD student at MIT. Um, and uh, while I've been at MIT, I've been working on systems, and more specifically, I've been focused on systems which make various consistency trade-offs. So specifically, um, I worked on a distributed query executor, so for SQL databases. I worked on a cache, which stores pre-computed data. Um, and most recently, I've been working on a concurrency control mechanism for multi-core databases. Um, so what this talk is going to be about, it's going to be about consistency, okay? And specifically why we need it. So I'm going to try to make an argument to you that consistency is important and that we shouldn't just throw it out the window. Uh, or I'm going to talk briefly about the different types of consistency um, and then get into the problem of consensus, which is distributed consistency. Um, finally, speak a bit about the CAP theorem and what it actually means. And then um, finally, give a little bit of a few thoughts on how I think we should actually deal with all of this and what we should do going forward. So, okay, consistency. Well, the way that I like to think about it is when you're building your application, how bad can things get? And that is your answer to what kind of consistency you're willing to deal with. Um, so here's a very classic example. This is uh, comments on an unnamed social network. And what has happened here is this guy posted a comment and it somehow appeared four times. It turned into many comments. And so there's many different reasons why this could have happened. Maybe an application web server um, didn't get a reply saying the comment had been received successfully and so it kept trying over and over again. Maybe um, for some reason this guy's request uh, went to one data center and then failed and then went to another data center and then another one and another one and this is how they got reconciled together. You know, this is um, a reconciliation technique is to just merge all of the rights. Um, and then, you know, the point here though is that what's happening is the data store is happily taking each of these as a new comment and that is not what the application intended. But this is pretty innocuous, right? I mean, you know, who cares if I don't get the message that my mom liked my status on Facebook. This is not the end of the world. These are social networks, right? But what about more critical applications on the web? For example, let's say we had a completely decentralized currency where there's no way to undo transfers um, in situations of fraud, as an example. Uh, so remember how in the news recently, have you guys heard about how a lot of Bitcoin exchanges have been going under? Is that, is that something you guys know about? Right. Um, you know, lots of times because they suffer some sort of attack, some kind of hacker, hacking attack, and they, um, someone transfers out a large amount of Bitcoin into their own personal wallets. Well, I've been looking into this a little bit, and I found an interesting example. Um, you know, usually these are described as security attacks, like the security on the website wasn't good enough, but here's what happened in at least one case, and this is with an exchange called Poloniex. Um, and this is a quote from an Ars Technica article. And the quote says, the hacker discovered that multiple simultaneous withdrawals are processed essentially at the same time and that the system software doesn't check quickly enough for a negative balance. So this is not a security problem. To me, this is a very classic transaction problem. This, what you want here is you want to be able to do the check and the decrement atomically. You want them to happen together. And for whatever reason, I don't know the details of this implementation, that wasn't happening. But we know how to build systems that do this. This is not an unsolved problem. And that's the point of consistency. Consistency guarantees help us reason about our code and avoid subtle bugs. Um, so the word consistency, unfortunately, has come to mean so many different things in computer science. I think it's one of the most misused words ever. Um, so there's the C in ACID. So ACID stands for atomic, um, consistent, isolation, and durable. And it describes transactions in a database. Um, these are the four properties that transactions should um, preserve. And when you see the C in ACID, that's actually a very specific type of consistency. And what that means is that once a transaction completes, the database should be in a consistent state. And that is dependent upon whatever the application developer decides a consistent state is. Like as an example, maybe um, some key value should never go below zero. And so if a database is consistent and you write your transactions correctly as a developer, then that means that at the end of every transaction, 
the guarantee will be maintained that a balance never went below zero. But it, it, that's like a very specific type of consistency that involves application um, constraints. Then there's consistency as in the CAP theorem. Okay, so this stands for consistency, uh, availability, and partition tolerance. And this is consistency in the case of multiple servers. So um, the previous one, we can talk about consistency in the case of one server too. So in one server, we can totally screw things up and not have consistency. So the CAP theorem really addresses, um, really relies on the definition of consistency that applies to many servers. And what it means is that, what it's essentially saying at a high level is to maintain consistency, you may have to halt perhaps indefinitely instead of just going ahead and processing a read and a write. Um, we'll, get, we'll get more into this later. Um, and then finally, there's many different types of consistency with varying guarantees. And really what all of them are trying to describe are um, an execution of reads and writes and what is valid to be returned. So if you issue some reads and writes to a system, um, what are valid results? So, um, you know, a lot of people think the mechanisms to enforce consistency are too strong and that it's not worth building it into our systems. But actually, you know, there's a mechanism at work enforcing consistency on every single read and write of every single computer, and that is cache coherence. So um, cache coherence is provided by our hardware, and the idea is that our hardware is automatically keeping uh, individual processors' L1 caches up to date. Um, and keeping them consistent as they read and write from central memory. And as we move into the age of multi-core, these caches become more and more important. It becomes very important that processors can access caches locally and read and write data locally because memory, accessing memory can be hundreds of thousands of times more expensive. Um, has anyone here ever tried to program a system without cache coherence? Yeah, I think it would be a nightmare. I think it would be absolutely horrible. Um, the fact that our hardware provides this for us lets us reason about our program and pretend like it's running on a single processor, and that's really important. So the type of consistency that cache coherence tries to provide um, is sequential consistency. So you might see this term around. And actually, cache coherence doesn't provide this, but let's, that's like a whole other talk, so let's just go with this for the moment. And what sequential consistency means is that um, the result of any execution of reads and writes is as though they happened in some order. So there's some ordering to the reads and writes, like someone wrote x equals one and someone read that x equals one. Um, and one key thing here with sequential consist consistency is that order doesn't have to match time. And we'll see what that means in a bit. Um, but order does have to match what each processor sees. And so that means that if multiple processors are reading and writing the same location in memory um, and interleaving their reads and writes, Sequential consistency says that the processor should see the reads and writes um, in the same order. And so here's an example, okay? So uh, here we have four processors, P1 through P4, and um, WXA means write the value A to X, and RXA means read the value A out of X, okay? And so what's happening here is that uh, P1's writing X equals A, P2's writing X equals B, P3 reads B and A, and then P4 reads B and A as well. Um, so, okay, based on what I said, is this sequentially consistent? What do you guys think? How many people think it is? How many people think it isn't? Oh, okay, wow, okay. So actually, this is sequentially consistent. Um, and I find this incredibly confusing as well. And the reason that it's sequentially consistent is because we are allowed to reorder things if we want to with sequential consistency, as long as it matches what each process sees and it still makes sense with the values returned. And so what we can do here is we can basically pretend like P1 actually wrote A later and P2 wrote um, B first. And the reason we can do that is because P1 and P2 are just sort of issuing these writes off into the ether. You know, they have no idea when their write happened. They don't do a read to actually see that their write, you know, happened at this point in time or that point in time. And so um, under sequential consistency, we're allowed to reorder this. And then all of a sudden, this execution makes sense. Write B, read B, write A, read A. Um, so I, I find this extremely confusing. And uh, yet that's the form of consistency most of us operate under, actually. Most of our machines, most of our systems, they don't even provide that. But, um, but there's this better form called external consistency. And basically, this says that results match time. 
And so what this means is that you can imagine as though you had an external observer looking at your system from the outside. And if an external observer reads in your system and sees that the value of a variable is something, that has to be preserved. And so in this example, we can see that it's not externally consistent. And the reason for that is that a ex little external observer could come along and notice that, hey, that right to B actually happened after the right to A in terms of time. That is how it happened. Um, and so then when this happens, the external observer will note that like nothing makes sense. Well, why does it look as though the right to B happened before the right to A? And so this execution is not externally consistent, even though it is sequentially consistent. So I've been talking about everything in terms of multiple processors on a single machine right now. But when we move this into the distributed setting, things get even crazier. So instead of shared memory, all we have is communication. Um, we have replication, but we don't have hardware cache coherence to help keep replicas up to date. And time kind of becomes a fuzzy concept. And so because of this, and because it's so much harder to deal with consistency in this context, um, people have introduced the idea of eventual consistency. This guy from Amazon, Amazon CTO, Werner, um, Werner Vogels, has written about this extensively. Um, and the idea here is that if no new updates are made to an object, eventually all accesses will return the last updated value. And the thing here is that actually time, like I said, is a fuzzy concept in a distributed system. So who knows what last even means? Um, and also, this is what always gets me about the definition of eventual consistency. When do we stop writing to things? Like, when do we just freeze and let the system coalesce? I don't think that actually really ever happens in real systems. So eventual consistency is like, it's a very fuzzy concept. Um, and so when we actually want stronger consistency guarantees in a distributed system, we turn to the problem of consensus. Um, and consensus is the idea of everyone agreeing on the same value. Um, and so the most famous consensus algorithm, obviously, is Paxos. Uh, how many people have heard of Paxos? OK, great. OK, so really quickly going to go through this. Invented by Leslie Lamport. Um, he recently won the Turing Award in part for this algorithm, which is amazing. Um, and the idea is that you know, someone proposes a value um, and sends it to the other servers in the system. Um, they receive it, and if the unique number included with that value is higher than anything they've seen, they say, OK. And then the guy, if he hears from a majority, says, OK, well, everyone then accept this value. And they say, OK. And then this guy knows that the value has been decided, all based on majorities. So pretty simple algorithm, two phases, makes sense. Um, the idea with Paxos is that uh, we can handle conflict. So if two proposals happen at the same time, given the fact that we're dealing with majorities here, only one proposal can win. Only one proposal will have a higher number, and it will talk to a majority of servers. And, it can, and that keeps us from deciding two different values for the same, the, at the same time. And this is the Paxos algorithm. So we can see here, it's actually not that complicated. So this is from um, the distributed systems class at MIT. The students have to implement Paxos in a lab. And this is the entirety of the pseudocode. This is what they do. It fits on one slide. Um, but unfortunately, one instance of agreement is not really enough in our distributed systems today. What we really want is this global log primitive. And that means that um, each operation is seen as a read or write in the log. Everyone agrees on the log and the ordering of the log, and then everyone applies those operations in order. And so that's, we can get external consistency doing this because instead of using time to order our operations, we're actually running a round of agreement for everything that's happening in the system in order to agree on the order in which things happen. And in addition to Paxos, there's a couple of other algorithms that do this, um, Zab by Zookeeper and View Stamped Replication. Um, and so, so, like I said, this is externally consistent. An outside observer can look at the log and see exactly what the values are for the entire system. And so how, what does this have to do with the cap theorem? Well, Paxos lets us guarantee correctness with a functioning majority, but it does not guarantee liveness. And liveness is the idea that things will progress, that the system will make progress. And so, OK, here's the cap theorem. Um, the cap theorem was born of Eric Brewer's Podsy talk in 2000, um, which was titled Consistency, Availability, and Partition Tolerance, Choose Two. Um, the idea here is that partition tolerance is a failure model, OK? And really what this theorem is saying is, you make a choice. Can you process reads or writes during a partition or not? Do you want to go ahead and process them and possibly get things into an inconsistent state, or would you rather stop and wait? And this is based on... Um, 
actually based on a paper written in 1985 by um, Fisher, Lynch, and Patterson called The Impossibility of Distributed Consensus with One Faulty Process. And what this paper is saying, it's a distributed algorithms paper, is that under an asynchronous model, we can't tell the difference between a message being delayed and a machine failing. That is the core of the CAP algorithm, or the CAP theorem right there. That right there. It's this idea that you can't tell if a machine's just taking a really long time or if it actually failed. Um, and, and so what this means is that if one machine fails at exactly the wrong time and if another machine fails at exactly the wrong time and this continues to happen, then, um, then we'll never reach consensus. And so it's an impossibility result. You know, It doesn't mean that this, it's impossible to reach consensus ever. It means that um, you know, it, it means something else. And so, uh, so, you know, we hear about the cap theorem and we think it means that we just can't have it all. You know, we can't have correct data and availability and partition tolerance. Um, well, so here's an analogy that I really like. So have any of you ever played Candy Crush? Okay, so I haven't actually played it, but I've played a lot of other tiling games. Um, and it turns out that this class of games is NP hard. Did you know that? So, Theoretically, this class of games is unsolvable. Given all the time in the universe, we're not able to solve these games. Yet, do we play these games? Do we enjoy them? Yes. Do we even sometimes beat them? Um, and so what this means for the CAP theorem is that it is impossible to 100% of the time decide everything on the internet if we can't rely on synchronous messaging. But we can 100% of the time decide everything if partitions heal which means that we know the upper bound on message delays, and we, it's not actually asynchronous messaging, it's synchronous messaging. Um, and I think this is a really key idea that's often ignored when we talk about the CAP theorem, is that if we know a bound on message delays, we're actually, the result actually doesn't hold. Um, yeah, and so we can still play Candy Crush. Um, and, and, and so I think the real question which we should be talking about, I'm running out of time, is that uh, we should really be looking at consistency versus performance, not consistency versus availability. Um, how do we reduce the number of messages? You know, Paxos had a ton of messages. How do we reduce that number while still producing a correct ordering and handling failures and making progress? Um, and so one example of, uh, of where they actually went in the other direction from you know, NoSQL and went back to sort of consistent systems is with Google Spanner, the giant distributed database. And they said, we believe it's better to have application programmers deal with performance problems due to the overuse of transactions rather than coding around the lack of transactions. So consistency is really important. It's, 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 it's vital for us to reason about our code. Um, and so in summary, we should be thinking about how to build fast systems that preserve consistency. Um, and then the slides will be available. There's a little bit of further reading, and that's it. And I might have a minute or two for questions. Thanks. <laughs> questions? OK, so uh, I really like that last statement. Um, but, I mean, Google was kind of in a unique position to go that, that way, right? They had a lot of money that they could throw on their data centers at these really high precision clocks to everyone and so on. So, what do you do unless you're in the same position? Or would you say you are encouraging Amazon and whoever hosts data centers to add these clocks as well and offer an API no, no, I, to people? I understand what you're saying. So, them? for people who don't know, Spanner uses atomic clocks. So, they bound the amounts that clocks can drift and that lets them do a lot of really cool tricks. And the answer is, yeah, we don't all have atomic clocks. You're right. But there are still other tricks that we can play. Um, so, there's a ton of optimizations on Paxos. People are still doing research in this area to reduce the number of messages. Within a data center, it might be more reasonable to talk about bounded clocks instead of across data centers. Um, I guess Spanner might, might not be the answer for everyone, but I think it's evidence that we should be going in this direction. More questions? If not, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. <laughs>